The Sci Fi Channel. Macabre Master Clive Barker and legendary director Robert Wise buzzing at you next. It's going to be a great sci fi buzz this week. Captain Marvel is on our side. Harlan Ellison takes us on a fantasy shopping trip. Comic book artist Norm Brayfogel. And two guys who have given us great fantasy, Robert Wise and Clive Barker. You've heard of pheasant under glass. We buzzers eat crow. Mm, good because I'm ravenous. Ooh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, never more, never more. Bye bye, Blackbird. Bye bye. Stop me! It's time to begin the show here. This is Sci Fi Buzz, Sci Fi Central here. I'm Mike Jurek, your friendly host. And uh, first question for the staff today Staff, who is your favorite horror creator? Let's start with you. Lovely glasses. <laughs> oh, goodness. Stephen King. Oh, good choice. Lee, how about you? Robert Block. Nice. Very good. How about you, Colleen? Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, I agree. Wait a minute, Alfred Hitchcock? Would he be in the horror category? Well, of course. The birds, Psycho. Well, what a rear window and stuff like that. Well, anyway, a contemporary horror specialist by the name of Clive Barker I think is fabulous. He does books, stories, movies. Another reason I like him, he created one of my favorites, Pinhead. We have such sights to show you. I didn't decide to write horror fiction. Horror fiction decided that I would be a writer for it. Uh, my imagination has always worked in uh, a pretty dark fashion. That's an understatement when you consider Creepmeister Clive Barker's track record. His reign of terror at the bookstores has given us ghoulish treats like Weave World, Books of Blood, and a Magica. Plus, his satanic sagas have spilled onto the big screen in films like Hellraiser and Candyman. Yep, this is a guy who really knows how to freak out his fans. Stories are primal forms. They tell us what we want. They tell us what we fear. Uh, they tell us what we may be. Uh, they tell us what we are. For those who can't imagine how Barker dreams up this stuff, the answer's simple. He keeps a dream journal. Amazingly, this prolific Liverpudlian has been known to draw entire passages from dream imagery. Particularly when I'm coming towards the end of a book, I become so obsessed with it that I'm uh, basically, it seems to me that my entire dream life is dominated by it. Um, and very often I'll find narrative solutions uh, in dreams as my subconscious turns over the possibilities. You can't leave me like this, you can't. What do you want me to do? Barker made a dramatic directorial debut on the 1987 fright flick Hellraiser, based on his novella, The Hellbound Heart. It's a family saga, isn't it? I mean, the scariest moment, I, for my money, in, in Hellraiser is when Kirsty, played by Ashley Lawrence, is, comes downstairs to greet her beloved father and then realizes that the father who is coming towards her across the hall is not her father at all, but her uncle in her father's skin. Uh, the Freudian ramifications of this <laughs> are endless. Come to daddy. Hellraiser introduced audiences to the ghastliest Cenobite on celluloid, Pinhead, whose bizarre bloody antics have ensured him a place in the annals of horror film history. You solved the box. We came. Now you must come with us. While Pinhead's hellish pranks send shivers down moviegoers' spines, Barker believes his film's truly horrifying moments are those that hit much closer to home. The great scares, I think, in, in, in Hellraiser are, are not really related to Pinhead. They're related to discovering that your stepmother is a murderess with a hammer. I mean, that's, that's the human level upon which the narrative is working. Barker is executive producer of the fourth Hellraiser installment, due in theaters early next year. He's also exec producing a sequel to Candyman, 
and has written the screenplay for an animated version of his best-selling children's novel, The Thief of Always. But Barker hasn't set aside directorial duties altogether. He's currently helming Lord of Illusion, a supernatural thriller based on his story, The Last Illusion. And ravenous readers of Barker books needn't fret. His latest offering, Everville, just hit bookstores. I think the moment that I walk away from a book or a movie or a painting and say, wow, that is perfect, it's probably the moment I should give up because it's not going to get any better than that. We're going retro with the captain after this disconnect. The 1941 serial, The Adventures of Captain Marvel, marked the first time a comic book superhero ever appeared on the silver screen. It's considered by many to be the finest serial ever made. And thanks to home video, you can continue to enjoy its superb special effects and first-rate production values. Where's Miss Wallace? Where's Miss Wallace? Talk fast or I'll... The chapter play chronicles the exploits of the world's mightiest mortal and his alter ego, Billy Batson. A mild-mannered radio news reporter, Billy can transform himself into Captain Marvel by uttering the magic word, Shazam! So that's where Gomer Pyle got that, huh? For 12 episodes, Captain Marvel battles the Scorpion. The mysterious villain is intent on obtaining six optical lenses that when aligned properly, can turn any material into solid gold or reduce it to atoms. Focus the beam directly into the mouth of the tunnel. Captain Marvel differs from other fantasy heroes in that he has no reservations about getting mean. Can you imagine Batman machine gunning his enemies in the back, no less? Or how about the Green Hornet using some poor guy's head for a battering ram? Oh. I don't think so. And can you picture Superman getting this nasty? Captain Marvel was brought to life by B-Western star Tom Tyler. Though he had been an Olympic weightlifter, he didn't do his own stunts, which is just as well. His stuntman, Dave Sharp, was one of the all-time best. His spectacular takeoff leaps and landings are legendary. He executed these amazing vaults with the aid of a small trampoline. To complete the illusion of flying, Republic Pictures relied on its crack special effects team, Howard and Theodore Lidecker. The brothers developed a technique which used an eight-foot-long dummy that slid along a great length of wire. The serial also borrowed lots of effects footage from other films to give it a first-class look on a shoestring budget. We will rate the breaches, boy. Signal when we're ready for you to haul in. Yes, sir. If more serials had been produced with the care and enthusiasm put into the adventures of Captain Marvel, they might have survived longer. It's a splendid celebration of low-budget craftsmanship that influenced TV and movies for decades. This is Mary Schmidt from Fitchburg, Wisconsin. I'm calling to recommend the new Quantum Leap novel, Knights of the Morning Star, by noted fantasy author Melanie Ron. Um, in this book, Sam leaps into a medieval recreationist group, very much like the Society for Creative, Creative Anachronism, and encounters people who could directly affect his chances of going home. Look at our expert, but Norm Brayfogel? Is that a comic book character name? No, look, comic book artist, Norm Brayfogel. Oh, it's right. a good name for an artist, though, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Nice stuff, too. Picasso. Dolly, Bray Fogel. Bray <laughs> Fogel. And a nicer guy you couldn't meet. When comic book artist Norm Bray Fogel was a kid, he didn't know what he wanted to be when he grew up. But his mother saw a creative potential in her son that she nurtured and encouraged. 
despite his stubborn nature. I didn't really consider getting into it until I took some private art lessons that my mother forced me to go to on Saturday mornings, which I hated doing because, you know, that's your one day off. I had to get up at 8 o'clock in the morning. What is this? It's like school. But uh, after a year of that, I decided I did want to make it, make it a living, make a living out of it. It didn't take Bray Fogel long to tap into the art form that really got his creative juices pumping, comic books. He majored in illustration at college. After graduation, he displayed his work at San Diego's Comic Con, where he met an agent who agreed to represent him. And in time, the ambitious lad landed at DC Comics, where he spent six years rendering images of the Cape Crusader for the Batman comics. The main thing was just coming from unknown status to, uh, to proving that you can do it on a monthly basis. And it seemed to take a long time, and it took a couple years only, really, before I started getting published, but it sure seemed forever. I would have been willing to start drawing comics in high school, although then I would have missed my wondrous college education. His stint at Batman made Bray Fogel a hot commodity in the comic book world. So he capitalized on this newfound clout to help him launch a personal project. He struck a deal with Malibu Comics to supply the artwork for Prime, one of Malibu's popular Ultraverse titles. In return, they agreed to publish Bray Fogel's dream project, Metaphysique. I wouldn't have just made the move just to draw Prime, frankly. I mean, it was a really nice change. In fact, I got a lot more out of it than I expected. And Prime is the opposite of Batman in almost every way. Well, he's he's yeah. a youngster. He's unsophisticated. He's got, he wears a bright costume. He's huge and muscular. Batman's more Bruce Lee-like or trim. But once I started getting into it, I really uh, realized that I needed a change that I didn't expect. I mean, it was a lot of fun. At present, Bray Vogel is wholeheartedly immersed in Metaphysique, which he describes as a cross between altered states and Superman. It's the story of a young man's coming of age, spiritually and um, uh, emotionally. And it's kind of a symbolic of my own coming of age. But it's told in the superhero format. Uh, and it's told in the backdrop of a dream laboratory where a number of um, people with disturb dream disturbances are being treated. As the title suggests, Metaphysique is a unique and somewhat daring endeavor. It explores various Eastern philosophies, not exactly mainstream material. But Brayfogle hopes that weaving them with a character-driven superhero story will attract comic book readers from all walks of life. A more mature audience could appreciate it, and I think kids could appreciate it, because on the surface, it's going to be basically a superhero story with a lot of action. The heart of the entire story, figuratively and literally, is a woman, so a woman could appreciate it as well. That assured self-confidence has established Norm Brayfogle as a force to be reckoned with in the competitive world of comics. Bringing the first Star Trek movie to the screen was no picnic. We'll talk to the director, Robert Wise, next. The hills are alive with the sound of music. Three Sopranos. I'm so sorry. That was my idea. You know, what do Clive Barker and Robert Wise have in common? Not much, you think? Well, of course, Robert Wise directed The Sound of Music. Clive created things like Pinhead. Well, Robert Wise made his very own Terran sci-fi classics back early in his career. It's clotted throughout the entire system. Five quarts of blood turned to powder. In theory, I suppose a single organism could do it. But in fact, there isn't an organism on Earth. You mean there didn't used to be? Director Robert Wise has been thrilling us with science fiction and horror films for over 50 years. He launched his directorial career in 1943 with Curse of the Cat People. Wise was supposed to be the film's editor, but was asked to step in and direct when the original director was fired. I was a very nervous cat on Monday morning when I came in. I got in the studio about 5.30 or 6 before the crew was there. I had to go in the, st the stage and turn on the stage lights so I could see the set and start with my finder figuring out how I was going to shoot the sequence. Wise was thrown into the water and told to swim. When he succeeded, he was given another film, The Body Snatcher. Wise directed legendary horror star Boris Karloff in this chilling tale about grave robbers. He was so eager and so keen to do this film because he saw it was an opportunity, an acting opportunity for him, you know. Uh, he wanted to prove to Hollywood and to the audience out there that he was more than just a man to play monsters. Wise's first foray into science fiction was The Day the Earth Stood Still. The film has become a classic. Like many of the director's pictures, it makes a comment about a controversial issue. I like very much the statement that, uh, that uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still made. It you know, said to the world, let's stop this nonsense of atomic warfare. This is, this is dangerous, will kill us all. Wise's next genre film was the ghost story, The Haunting. 
He terrified the audience without even showing any boogeymen. Instead, he relied on things like sound effects and distortion in the camera lens to build fear. He recalls that he had a hard time talking the head of Panavision into letting him use a prototype lens. At that time, I think about the widest angle lens they had was around 35 in Panavision Anamorphic, and I, I wanted something more extreme if possible, and I, I told that to Bob. I said, don't you have anything wider than that? Don't you have a 30, 28 or something? And he said, well, we, we, we are working on a 28. We're developing, but it's still got distortion in it. I said, oh, that's exactly what I want. I want that distortion. Wise's anti-militarism reared up again in the Andromeda strain. The science fiction thriller made a strong statement about the insanity of biological and chemical warfare, which annoyed the Defense Department. They denied Wise's request for assistance on the film. Of course, you want something in the Defense Department, Department and they have to read your script. And they read the script and turned us down. I guess they didn't like our, our little lick in there at, uh, at, uh, at the biological warfare. Wise explored reincarnation in Audrey Rose. Although the film has become a cult horror flick, it was a commercial disappointment when released. But Wise's next film exploded at the box office. Though Star Trek The Motion Picture successfully launched the Star Trek big screen franchise, it was a nightmare to make. The studio was racing to beat the release of some other outer space films, and the pressure to finish the picture on time was enormous. So we started to shoot uh, with only the first act of the script uh, right. And we were, we were re rewriting the script, working on the script all the way through to the very end, to the last day of shooting. The last few days of shooting, I was getting two or three sets of changes for the next day's work. And that's a very unsatisfactory way of working. Robert Wise hasn't directed any genre film since Star Trek. But with his rich legacy of science fiction, gothic, and supernatural thrillers, he continues to shock, horrify, and incite us. Just down the time stream, Harlan Ellison does some fantasy shopping for us. Commercial interests. The, um, the network has said to me, uh, why don't you do a show in which you show us things that uh, people should buy? Some of the toys that you're looking at and buying these days. And I'm saying, this show provides me with very little graft, folks. I don't get any real high-ticket items. But I'll show you a few things that are worth spending your money on. Because as that great American Ronald Reagan <laughs> said, uh, the business of America is business. He, of course, he stole that from Calvin Coolidge, but who am I to cavil? Here is a wonderful thing that I'm actually not showing you because uh, I told Jeff Killian that I wanted to show it on this show, and the next thing I knew it was being shown on SF Trader. Uh, you can buy it uh, through SF Trader on this here network, uh, but it is a reproduction of the original Day the Earth Stood Still poster. It is quite beautiful. These are published by a publishing company in New York called NBM. These are the Ray Bradbury Chronicles, and there are six volumes of them so far. And these are Bradbury's stories adapted and illustrated by the best in the business. And let me show you, let me show you the kind of thing that they are, for instance. Here is an adaptation of Ray Bradbury's uh, wonderful story, A Sound of Thunder. They go for uh, 1995 in hardcover. They got numbered ones that are, uh, you know, more expensive, but uh, these are very, very nice. I urge you to get these. This is also done by NBM. They've only done two volumes of this so far. It's the Fairy Tales of Oscar Wilde, illustrated by the superb artist P. Craig Russell. And uh, this is volume one, this is volume two. And let me show you a page out of this. This is a story called The, uh, the Selfish Giant. Look at this. Ah, oh, is this beautiful? These are only $15.95 a piece. That's NBM. Pops, that makes the trading cards, did a shadow set for the movie. Now, these are called uncut sheets. These are the cards on the sheets before they cut them up. So you can't get them this way, but you'll get the sheets themselves. Now, the set is 90 cards, and most of them, uh, can you see this down here? Can you shoot that over there? Most of them are the, are, the, uh, are the movie scenes, which are okay. They're okay. But in between, they've got art. They've commissioned real art by various comic book artists of the shadow. It's beautiful stuff. And there's a full extra set of these, and these are the covers done by Jim Steranko, for the shadow paperbacks that he did in the 80s. And on the backs of the cards, oh, you're gonna love this. Look at this, look at this. Here's, here's Steranko. Of course, this was Steranko when he was about nine years old. He's my age now. And this is the woman who played uh, Margot Lane on the radio. 
And this is the guy who created the shadow, Walter Gibson. Well, he didn't actually create him, but he wrote the shadow novels. And that's Brett Morrison who played the shadow on radio in the 1940s, and Orson Welles. And these are the backs of the cards. It's a very, very nice set. Oh, you're gonna love this. This is the latest of the Neil Gaiman Sandman graphic novels. This one is called Brief Lives. These are the two Sandman sculptures. This one is available now, and you can buy it if you want. Very expensive. You'll have to hock your house. This one is a prototype of the one that's forthcoming. It'll be out around Christmas of this year, 1994, and it is based on the P. Craig Russell art from uh, the Arabian Nights uh, edition of the Sandman. Uh, this one I got, it's a prototype that was given to me by Neil at a uh, benefit dinner, banquet dinner that was done for me. Now, uh, excuse me, would you, would, you, would you come over here? Yes, now I'm, I'm gonna go away now, I'm gonna leave you here to look at these, and I'll see you next week with some more good things like uh, these books here. Take care of yourself. That's all the time we have for Sci-Fi Buzz this week. Before we get away, a special thank you and a kind of a reluctant goodbye to a very important member of our Sci-Fi Buzz staff, Piers Bath. He's on camera right there. Now, come on, Pierce. Get out from underneath that camera. Lee, can you get it? Okay, well, Lee's got a hold of the camera. Come on. All right, everybody, come on in. Here we go. We have a cake for you. Now, where are you off to? North Carolina? Mm-hmm. We're breaking lights. No. <laughs> yeah. Can I get your hair like it normally is? <laughs> He's going off to North Carolina uh, to live down there. Mm -hmm. But you will be coming back in and shooting the show for us every now and then, right? Possibly, yeah. You're never this Depends quiet. The rates, right? <laughs> this guy's responsible for kind of the look of this show. It's great. Oh, come on. Yay, Eat some of the cake. Very nice. Thank you. See, it says good luck in this little camera yeah. there. Yeah. Kind of looks like you. Okay, blow them all out, Pierce. Like, yeah. All right, everybody, a round of applause for Pierce. <laughs> come on, you. Blow hard. <laughs> The mysteries of aliens, the magic of Houdini, the miracles of angels. Now the real stories, people and events are explained in Mysteries, Magic and Miracles, hosted by Patrick McNee, coming up next.